Welcome back to the Createx stage at the COGEX Hybrid Festival 2021, co-curated with the UK Creative Industries Council, a forum between government and industry, which brings together all sectors of the creative industries from film to fashion, advertising to architecture, games to music, publishing to performance. You can find out all about us at thecreativeindustries.co.uk. The CIC promotes and protects opportunities for growth in the UK creative industries, and Createch is one such opportunity, with high growth investment and jobs in new emerging areas. We publish new research on Monday, the Createch Report 2021 with TechNation. Do check out the TechNation website, TechNation.io, to see the results. I'm Janet Hull, and I lead the Createch programme for the Creative Industries Council. And I'm also Director of Marketing Strategy at the IPA. And it's my pleasure to be your MC for today. Please share your thoughts and comments and get to know each other in the chat. Ask questions of the panel through the Q&A. And on your social, please use the hashtags createcuk and cogex2021. Our next session is curated by Moore Kingston Smith and its title enticing title is Around the World in 1800 Seconds. As commercial partner of the CIC website and an associate partner of the CIC Createch program, Moore Kingston Smith are fully integrated into our drive to help the Createch sector thrive on both the national and international stage, offering strategic advice to Createch businesses to help maximize their growth. As a member of More Global, a network of accountancy and advisory firms in over 100 countries, Moore Kingston Smith is also excellently placed to provide support to global creative businesses or those looking to expand internationally. A Moore Kingston Smith panel of experts is going to take us around the world in 1800 seconds. Let's start that clock. Ably facilitated by Moore Kingston Smith London partner, Esther Carter. Over to you, Esther. Thank you very much, Janet, for a very lovely introduction and a warm welcome to everybody who's joined the session this afternoon. So as Janet said, um, my name is Esther Carter. I'm a partner at Moore Kingston Smith, which is a top 15 firm of accountants and advisors um, and leading advisors really to the media industry. And I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of experts um, who are all part of our more global network. Um, so I'm joined by Patrick Rosario, Jennifer Mailhez, um, Olivia Barbeau and Damien Ryan. So Jennifer um, joins us from um, Texas. Um, she's a managing director and brings more than 20 years experience in areas um, ranging from strategic growth, M&A and due diligence. Patrick joins us from um, more Hong Kong. Um, he's managing director of advisory services and has been instrumental um, in advising private equity investments in the media sector right across Asia, um, and in particular in post-production for movies, TV series um, using new technologies. Olivier is the managing partner of Moore Johannesburg um, and has got extensive strategic um, and corporate finance and advisory experience, um, and he's implemented MMA transactions um, for both listed and unlisted companies right across the continent. And last but not least, um, Damien Ryan, my colleague from Walking for Smith, heads up our media corporate finance offering in the UK. And as well as being an expert on M&A, um, Damien is also an authority on Martech and Digital and has authored books on the latter that have been, I'm told, translated into more than 10 languages and are recommended reading at universities in the world over. So each of our panelists really sort of works very closely alongside investors and they really understand what's at the heart of investment decisions that are being made and the priorities of those investors. I mean, we've seen a bit of a shift in investor sentiment and valuations in the wake of COVID, making now a really good time for businesses to sort of reset and, and reframe their offerings. So this discussion will address what's hot in the eyes of investors across the world. And it's really designed to give you an advantage when it comes to repairing your business, either investment or an ultimate sale. As Janet said, if you have any questions as we go along, please do put them in the chat function and I will try and weave them in to our panellists. So to kick things off, um, COVID, it sort of can't really ignore that one um, and, and can't ignore the, sort of the effect that it's had on the investment and the M&A landscape. But what is the, what is the recovery um, looking like from that? Maybe coming to you first, Jennifer. 
Thanks, Esther. Um, big picture, you know, middle market M&A activity worldwide was down obviously in 2020 as compared to 2019. Um, and that wasn't dissimilar from our experience. We had a lot of deals ready to go to market when everything started shutting down. And a lot of those deals did go to market in Q, Q3, Q4, which is actually when activity accelerated and that trend has definitely continued in 2021. Strategic buyers have led the way, but PE is heavily participating and even more so now. And I think there's a lot of positive tailwinds coming into place in 2021, both in the US and worldwide, which I know the rest of the group will get into, you know, vaccines are rolling out. We've got a stable post-election environment here in the US. Um, credit markets are stronger and there's a lot of pent up demand. Um, in the US, there's this very specific thing where there's a potential increase in capital gains rates. Most people believe that's likely to go into effect 1122. So there's a lot of demand here in this second half of 21 to get deals finished for that reason. That's great, thanks. And what about Damien here in the UK? What are we seeing? Well, thanks, Esther. And look, first of all, from the firm to anybody who's been affected anywhere by COVID, obviously, obviously our sympathies and, uh, you know, uh, obviously, you know, life goes on, business goes on too. Um, speaking from an M&A standpoint, it's very much been a game of two halves, hasn't it? The, yeah. how things seem to just absolutely hit a brick wall around March, April last year. And um, what we're seeing so far in 2021, from an M&A standpoint is um, an unprecedented uh, recovery. Uh, we've had uh, deal volumes three times the level so far in 2021 compared to last year in 2020. London Stock Exchange are telling us that in the even in the first six weeks of 2021, they've had more deal announcements than any year since the year 2000. And those deal announcements in the first six weeks would have counted for something like 25 billion pounds in M&A transactions. So it's definitely a completely different world from an M&A standpoint now than it was this time last year. Um, on growth capital, uh, similar situation, boosted by investor confidence. Um, for those of you um, viewing us or listening, that there is an interesting, a very good report actually on growth capital uh, from Moore Kingston Smith, which um, should be available. But what it will show is that in the first quarter this year, that fundraising um, actually is at a 10 year high, which was something that I don't think any of us could honestly have expected um, this time last year. And interestingly enough, the, the, the deals, the growth capital deals that are in the 10 to 15 million pounds, that bracket have actually doubled. So it's not just lots and lots of small deals that are happening right now, but it's deals that are in that 10 to 15 million pound range as well. So overall, it's 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 a very, very positive time. Thanks, Damien. And Livia, perspective from South Africa? Yeah, thanks, uh, Damien. I think our experience here in South Africa has um, is, is, is mirrored what you felt in the UK. Definitely last year was a game of two halves. It, uh, it felt like the phones weren't going to ring in the first half of the year. Uh, every deal that was on the plate suddenly went into hold mode. And then suddenly, uh, towards the end of the year, it felt like a little bit of a feeding frenzy. Uh, a lot of activity. I think people realized the time to do to do transactions was now, and they, and they certainly got busy. I mean, you speak about uh, access to capital. What we found here is that a lot of South African tech businesses um, uh, started accessing uh, capital pools in in the UK and and the US. It felt like there was this massive concentration of funding out there. We have an expression here: when the when the ducks are quacking, you need to feed them, and it certainly had that kind of feel to it. Um, but we've seen some record transactions here, different multiples. We had uh, an announcement of uh, the We Buy Cars transaction, which was um, We Buy Cars is the largest online secondhand uh, motor vehicle. Uh, website in the country, and that traded at record high multiples, nine times multiples, something that we're not used to in, in our market, uh, and at a value of uh, 6.4 billion rands, certainly a significant transaction. So we see that activity continuing in this, in, in this year, and um, long may it continue. Thank you. And, uh, and Patrick, what about the Asian market? 
Yes, thank you, Esther. Like the global trend, uh, the Asian market, it's, it's similar with decreasing investment when COVID started. But since you know, late 2020, uh, we have seen a very fast recovery of investment uh, into the sector, uh, in particular related to media technology. Uh, we also see a lot of cross-border uh, deal within the region, but also a lot of uh, cross-border deals uh, outside of the region too, uh, with the Americas, uh, with uh, Europe. So maybe just sort of obviously a big part of the investment community and increasingly I think is um, is, is private equity. So maybe just focusing a little bit on, on private equity houses. What is the, the current sort of PE activity like in, in your market? Maybe staying with you, Patrick, for a bit. Okay. Yes, um, the private equity is one of the top investors in the Asia region and, and also the venture capitals and, and the angel investors. So people investing uh, very early in the stage then. Uh, the country that has the most deal from the private equity would be like Japan, uh, China, South Korea, and also we see uh, India is coming up very, very fast too. Uh, a very good example, uh, in April 2021, uh, SoftBank's you know, Vision Fund 2, uh, the leading you know, the, uh, Japanese private equities, uh, enter into an agreement uh, to provide capital injection into our uh, you know, SDI group, which is a international um, a provider of localization services, you know, such as providing subtitle doublings uh, to the medias and the entertainment uh, industry for considerations of uh, 160 million uh, uh, US dollar. So it's very active uh, in the uh, Asia market. Thank you. Jennifer, a look from the US. Yeah, um, so, you know, worldwide, uh, Pitchbook put out something late in 2020 that's still holding true. So there was 1 trillion of dry powder that had been raised for deals. And the expectation was that in 2021 fundraising would be about 330 billion on top of that. So what we've seen is that, you know, a lot of times our clients sell to strategic buyers. It's a better offer. It's a better synergy and fit. But what we found is there was still a PE activity during the pandemic, but it was down. But now, um, we're seeing robust interest in businesses that are um, good targets for companies. And even in industries that typically were traded lower, you know, maybe not fully realized businesses, things like that. I mean, we're seeing PE offering eight to 10 times EBITDA, which is was virtually unheard of two or three years ago, but there's just such strict competition for good deals. And there's so much dry powder out there that there's just a lot of interest in getting their funds invested in good deals you know, as compared to the market. Um, we've also seen just more on the technology side, a lot of um, private equity interest in more subscription-based businesses or recurring revenue businesses. And those tend to be valued off revenue multiples with kind of an eye toward profitability, cash flow over the longer term, rather than maybe, you know, immediate profit realization. And Olivia, is there, is there much activity going on in, in South Africa? Yeah, I'm, um, certainly our experience has been very similar to what Jennifer's just highlighted. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of the private equity firms hunting for assets that probably they wouldn't have looked at a couple of years ago. They've now uh, got their attention. Uh, what, what we've seen is some of the international private equity firms entering the local market and getting into bidding wars for uh, what would generally be considered as small IT businesses locally. Uh, for instance, we've got uh, Valaris uh, private equity out of Canada that has entered into a, a bit of a bidding war for one of the IT businesses in, in SA. And just to put that into kind of context, uh, the target company, which is Adapt IT, share prices were uh, around, around 20 about a year ago. Current bid offer is at 7 rand 50 the share. Um, so certainly a bit of a feeding frenzy there. And, and, uh, and I can see that continuing. Um, and that is, again, to Jennifer's point, software as a service private equity looking for good, sustainable, repeatable earnings. Um, and then, you know, in a, in the South African stock market, uh, the largest entity there is, is, is NASPAS. Uh, NASPAS, it, it's the giant of the Janusburg Stock Exchange. Its claim to fame is that it must have made one of the best private equity tech bits uh, in history. In 2001, it bought 46% of 10 cent for a mere $32 million. Very nice. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Damien, absolutely. <laughs> Last valuation of 10 cents was about 770 billion US. Uh, that's uh, private equity certainly getting it right and certainly the capital finding the right kind of asset. 
and 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 Damien, I mean, like from my experience, it's uh, a bit explosive here in the UK too. Yeah. I Esther, absolutely. And just listening to Patrick, Jennifer and Oliver, there's one thing the audience are definitely going to get from this session, and that's a lot of very, very big numbers. And I don't want to be left out of this. Uh, because, uh, and it, 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 JP Morgan just released a report about private capital. And as we know, private equity forms the, the largest part of the private capital market. And they value the, the, the private capital market now at $7 trillion. Dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure exactly how to write seven trillion down on paper, but luckily I work with lots of accountants, so I'm sure there's somebody who will step up to the plate and uh, tell me how many zeros there should be. But more importantly, that seven trillion expected to grow to 13 trillion by 2025. So there's something else happening. It's not just about private equity for private equity's sake. I think what we're actually seeing here is the the maturation, the growing up of the private capital sector yeah. in the same way that the, that the public markets have been around for many, many years. What we're seeing now is investors being drawn to a market which is becoming more and more mature, more reliable, but it's actually outperforming the public markets as well. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's very, very exciting. Uh, back to London again. Record levels of cash. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned dry powder. Uh, we, we hear that expression almost on an hourly basis at the moment in the team. Um, but there have actually been nine proposed private equity takeovers of listed companies in London in the last four weeks. Yeah. So that'll tell you that there's bargain hunting going on, match with dry powder. Yeah, so it, it's it's a very, very interesting time. Thank you. I mean, in particular, what sort of sectors um, are looking most attractive to investors and, and what about valuations? Are they sort of varying particularly between the sectors? I mean, maybe staying with you for a bit, Damien. Um, sectors wise, um, I mean, tech is, you know, by far, um, you know, the, the, the most important, most active sector. Healthcare is also ranks very highly. Uh, others, uh, energy, financial services, real estate, um, one that um, I, I, I like keeping my eye on is what um, many call consumer discretionaries. And these are, you know, often much more volatile type sectors in terms of valuation. But here we're talking about media, we're talking about Amazon, Airbnb, all those kind of stocks, which um, I, I think are particularly interesting. Uh, valuation wise, um, it, it, it is very, very difficult to, you know, say there's one valuation for one particular kind of company because so much depends on the the, the factor support in that company. Uh, the the opportunity of that of that acquisition, for one, is a, is a very much a, a high determining factor. Um, but then you get into uh, you know uh, everything from you know management team to prospects to market share. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer very uh, correctly mentioned that revenue multiples can be you know at a certain size can be just as uh, valid as uh, our old friend EBITDA, or as a, a friend of mine recently called it EBITDAC, which stands for Earnings Before Interest, Tax, Depreciation, Amortization, and COVID. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Damien. Um, before I move to Patrick, just a reminder for the audience, um, please, if anyone does have any questions that are specific to the panellists or general questions, then please do put them in the chat function and I will weave them in. Um, so, Patrick, um, what's the sort of, what's the story from Asia? I think, uh, as the, I guess the biggest sectors uh, in Asia, we actually see uh, digital uh, media. It's a, it's a very big one. Uh, the second one, it's actually uh, media and entertainment. In, in terms of valuation, I think uh, we, we, we make some comparisons uh, between um, valuations in Asia and the U.S. Uh, we, we see there there is a, a large gap um, for the uh, digital uh, media company. The U.S. seems to have much higher valuations. Than. Uh, in the area of media and entertainment, uh, the comparison between U.S. and, and Asia are, are very similar. And, and we also look at, you know, pre-profit companies too. Uh, there seems to be a lot of pre-profit pre company too. And we also did some comparison between US and Asia. We found that uh, the US valuation are much higher um, uh, in, in both digital media and, and the media entertainment company. Then I guess, you know, when you have the valuation, it's, it's low in certain subsectors um, um, uh, in the industry. 
but it may be a good investment too. It, it, if it's turned out to be a, a very you know successful and viable business, uh, the investments will 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 because the expected valuation is not that good then. But then it may turn out to be a very good investment over long term then too. As as Oliver mentioned about you know Tencent uh, in this part of the world too. So. Thank you. And, and Jennifer, what are the hot sectors in the U.S.? Really in the U.S., we're seeing it across a lot of different sectors. Um, we have three active deals right now, and this is somewhat coincidental, but somewhat not in the um, kind of more eco-friendly building products space. But um, but what I found is most of the interest is around deals that what are what I'll call COVID resilient, right? Companies that performed well in 2020 or new knew where their performance gaps were in 2020 um, across a lot of different sectors, technology, manufacturing, services, um, but, you know, heavy on innovation, heavy on ways to kind of reconstruct their business. Um, and almost everyone's getting at least approached uns with unsolicited offers. And so, you know, I think it's imperative that those companies are actually prepared, um, have good information in place. So even if they're not ready to do a transaction now, they're at least ready to engage in some level of conversation um, in advance and really you know, engage with a buyer and investor. We had one client that we're actually getting ready to close here in the next 30 days that had talked to three or four interested parties before we ever got involved. And because they didn't have everything put together, this deal's taken a lot longer time to close than you know someone who we'd actually gotten in there ahead of time, gotten prepared and moved it forward. So it definitely moves the transaction along more quickly. And with that compressed timing and people wanting to get things done by the end of 21, um, you know, I just think it's really important to have that preparation done because right now you can get a higher valuation than you might think. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer. And, and Olivia, what are your community particularly interested in? Yeah, I think Damien touched on something which is quite relevant. So we've seen um, uh, this increase in tech. There's no doubt about it. It feels a little bit frothy, definitely healthcare. But what we're seeing is actually the convergence of those two. So health tech becoming very, very relevant. Um, I think uh, that's going to be a theme going forward and certainly where we would see a lot of activity. But um, you know, Jennifer raised a really good point about um, there is money out there for opportunities, but uh, the money is still smart. The money does know what it's looking for. And there is absolutely no substitute for being prepared when you're going into these kind of negotiations. Uh, and and having the right sort of um, advice next to you to make sure that you are ready to take your 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 business to market. I mean, there's some obvious things that you need to be uh, bearing in mind. There is as a as an entrepreneur who's got a business and is potentially looking to attract some capital. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that brings me on to sort of the next question, really. I mean, obviously, that gives us a really good flavour for the sort of the investor appetite, the particular sectors they're looking for, the sort of multiples they're prepared to buy. But sort of in practical terms, if you're a business that's mm -hmm. looking to get some investment, raise some money or, or, or go to, to sale, what are sort of the practical things that media and tech companies need to be thinking about before sort of starting that process as, as, as part of that preparation? I mean, maybe sort of staying with you, Olivia, to sort of build yeah. on the point you were just mm -hmm. making. Yeah, so, so we um, we think it's very important that you prepare to, to go through kind of a corporate readiness program, that you've got your elevator pitch fine-tuned, that you know what it is that you're trying to communicate to investors. Uh, what we find often is that we've got uh, entrepreneurial, clever tech-savvy bodies who don't necessarily know how to communicate their idea across to uh, financial users. So hone that skill, hone that elevator speech, that you know exactly what you're trying to communicate across uh, to the investor and then be very clear about what it is that you're looking for. Um, if, if, it, if it's funding, then what is the funding for? How am I going to deploy my funding? How am I going to make a return for the investor going in? And just doing the basic homework and getting that all um, addressed and sorted out before you approach the market. It's very difficult if you've approached the market in an unorganized uh, manner up front You've almost got to take a couple of steps back before you can then reapproach the market properly. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Jennifer, what sort of advice would, would you be giving your clients? There's a couple areas we focused in, although Olivia, your um, an analysis there was spot on. We This doesn't make us look the best, but it's a good tale. We had a technology client that we, um, and they had some technology in the oil and gas space. It was a platform and the platform had been successful in one segment that had turned down 
this was about five or six years ago, but they, because they were trying to reinvent themselves, every time we met with them, they changed their focus to whatever the hot button term of the month was. And it was impossibly hard to raise money for them. I mean, we eventually kind of said, this is not our, our fit because you guys need to refine your plan before we can really do this for you. And so I think your dialogue there was just spot on just based on experience. And, you know, we wouldn't have picked up that client, but it was a referral from a reliable source. <laughs> um, but I think a big piece of that is, um, and it does relate to that story, is the predictability of the revenue streams that you have into the future, you know, either in backlog or just consistency or target markets or target customers or expansion of geography. But in any area, how, how much you can predict what that future is going to look like. For a lot of businesses, if they performed well in 2020, that predictability is a lot easier to demonstrate than ones that maybe didn't. Um, and being able to demonstrate the quality of your actual earnings on that money. Um, you know, proof of that, hey, we've been able to innovate through this time. We were able to bring new services and products to market quickly is important and just actively position the company for success. I mean, that's an advantage of entrepreneurial middle market businesses for all from all time, right? That they've been able to pivot and change during these turbulent times and do it well. Um, and then one thing that's been interesting uh, that I found late 2020 and this year is a lot of the deals we've been working on, they're very interested in retaining the people, um, more so than what I saw in the past, you know, that making sure that those teams came along with them because it's a larger company that really wants that innovation involved. Or And even if it's a private equity group, they want to keep that management team in place to run kind of this more niche, innovative business that they didn't have before. So I've definitely seen more more emphasis on retaining management than in a higher percentage of our deals than I did in the past. Thanks, Jennifer. And Patrick, what, what advice are you giving to your community? Yes, I'd like to echo uh, all of her comments. I guess the, the first thing you should think of is really about the use of the proceeds. And if you think of, you know, prospective investors, um, they, they, they set the company, um, you know, valuations using financial models. Uh, the critical things would be the use of proceeds uh, and and also other uh, information that you could provide and also some of the backgrounds and expertise and and, and experience. So if, if your company are able to, um, you know, have the capacity to demonstrate that you could achieve and exceeds, you know, investors' uh, expectations will really drive your future uh, equity values then. And Damien, what would you like to add? I mean, like Patrick, um, you know, absolutely agree with um, Oliver and Jennifer on the, the, you know, the key components of, you know, be prepared. Um, it, it just makes life so much easier. Not, 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 don't, not for us necessarily, but for the entrepreneurs out there as well. It just it really does pay off. All those hours spent checking and rechecking things, um, really, really important. And again, Jennifer's point about the quality of earnings, you know, what they actually mean um it's so important too uh, i want to put something else out there though um i think bravery i think this is a great time to be brave um i, I i'm sure we've all seen um investor decks and pitches and business plans which talk about solving real world problems mm -hmm. but only doing it for half a million dollars okay it doesn't stack up if you're going to solve a big problem and major with a fantastic solution out there the the ambition has got to the ask if you like has got to match the ambition of the plan mm. and uh, time and time again you see those two things just you know just missing the point um and you, you see these fantastic entrepreneurs with great management teams wonderful presentations super ideas but don't be timid don't be shy go ahead and ask for that money because you know something your competitors definitely will. So please be brave, be braver. As we go forward out of COVID, let's all be braver. That's good, that's good advice, Damien. Uh, and what about sort of looking further into the future? I mean, so the overarching theme of this conference is, is very much the looking <laughs> to the future. So what sort of emerging trends do you see over the next 10 years in the investment community? Um, maybe stay, staying with you, Damien, for a bit. Sure. Um, well, um, it's a great question. Um, I, I, I think that perhaps the bit I want to uh, talk a bit about is um, um, being good. Um, 
by being good, I mean demonstrating that your business has got a purpose, um, that your business is um, mindful and active around issues around ESG, around diversity, uh, and giving something back. And, you know, it, it, it's not for the investors um, that you're doing this. It's for the consumers. Because you know what? Consumers these days, and I think the internet's been a huge catalyst in this, the, uh, consumers these days are far, far more savvy um, than, than ever before. And given the choice between giving your business to company A versus company B, when company A is being transparent, is being diverse, is being good, versus company B, even if that price is higher, I think it can make a significant difference. Um, that's the first thing. So being good is no longer a choice, if you like. It's, it, it is a prerequisite in this modern world. And the other thing that I'm, re I'm really excited about, um, and maybe we, we forget sometimes, but half the world is yet to go online. And um, I'm really excited by what they're going to teach us because one, there's one thing about agility that you can leapfrog mindsets, you can leapfrog generations of thinking, just because you haven't been exposed into that same into that same cell of of, of data. So, uh, ten years time, there's definitely going to be more people online than there is now. Whether it's going to be a hundred percent or not is probably unlikely, but I'm really excited uh, to see what emerging markets, uh, particularly from places like Africa, and Oliver, you've got to jump in here with this one, um, as to what they, what it's not what we're going to teach them, it's what we're going to learn from them as they are basically experiencing digital media for the first time. Look, Damien, I think you're spot on there. Um, and the whole ESG angle is, is it's not a nice to have anymore. It's right. absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. um, I would go so far as to say that uh, appropriately positioned, it'll attract a premium valuation. It it will attract a premium valuation. There's no doubt. And uh, um, the, the online space is only going to grow, uh, particularly in emerging markets like Africa, where they will leapfrog or jump different versions of technology, um, like it's been demonstrated in the past, where we jump straight onto onto 5G, uh, where there was no technology before. I see it continuing. It's a good point. Yeah. Patrick, would you add anything to that? Uh, yes, I echo my, you know, panelists' um, uh, uh, feedback. Then, social responsibility investment is a is a key investment theme. That you know, uh, the pandemic reinforced, you know, concerns over climate change, and also renewed it, uh, calls to eliminate uh, social injustice. And and Jennifer, what about about the US? Like, I assume it's equally as important over there. It definitely is. And I mean, I think a lot of it just comes back to sustainability of everything in your business. Um, kind of shifting a little bit on that comment, though, because I think it kind of correlates. Um, one thing we've seen is just in the deal making process, how um, remote activities have changed it, both in a good and bad way. You know, there's a lot more use of virtual deal making and diligence, but there's still nothing that replaces face to face contact. We had a good sized client going through a QOB all remote. And I mean, she felt like she was getting cross-examined and was having a lot of impatience with the deal and things that, you know, you, parts of the process that you don't have to manage because usually it's a much more compressed timeline and it's easier to be patient. And it's just what I found in the deal-making process, there's a lot more, when it's all done remote, it's there's less trust, there's more information that has to be exchanged earlier and framed in the right way. And um, and then the other thing I'm just seeing from a kind of shift in that, too, is because of that virtual deal making process, rep and warranty insurance on those transactions is becoming more common and might give you know investors a little more confidence in wine spots and deals and things like that. Before, you know, that was almost exclusively private equity using that insurance. Now we're seeing it in a lot of strategic investment type deals as well. And I know. You know, we talked a lot about the external and how it affects the business, but I think just seeing how it affects the deal making process has been really interesting and in how fast that's innovated in such a short time. Thank you. We're getting Esther, uh, Esther, if you don't mind, I, I just want to add on one more comment. Yeah, sure. so, uh, you know, because we, we, we talk about future, I guess uh, there's another um, key key issues, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, going forward, I guess, you know, do activities in the sectors of media, techs, uh, will face you know much greater regulatory 
and also the, uh, political, um, uh, geopolitical, you know, scrutinies. And so it might, you know, may affect, you know, the completions of the deal, and also it might take longer to complete some of these deals too. Uh, unfortunately, we, we we see this as you know panning out um, in you know in in the world. Then. Thank you. I was just, Thank you. Just, one more comment. Yeah, thanks. We have got four minutes left of this session, so you can have a ten seconds each takeaway tip before I wrap up. Same with you, Patrick. Then. <laughs> uh, okay. I my my suggestion would be focus on on customer growth. I guess this will be you know the key area that the investors will 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 uh, look at then. You know when they when they invest, they will look at how you actually uh, uh, deploy. Uh, the investment and how you'll be able to grow uh, from expanding your 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 customer base and generate you know a better valuations um, you know in the future in the future future then stop it. And I I want to take a quote from one of my favorite movies and that is show me the money. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it you've got to be able to demonstrate very clearly to your investor what's in it for him. Why do I need your investment? And how can my investment and 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 your idea be put together to make something meaningful? Brilliant, Jennifer. Um, Olivia kind of stole mine, and so did Patrick. But you know, I would say a very clear value proposition. This is what I do. This is why it has value, and what that path to growth is. Doesn't mean you have to have implemented all of it, but means you have to have a clear vision of here's different ways we could grow and how you could help me do that. Yeah. And Damien. Yeah, and I'm probably talking to some of the uh, entrepreneurs at the um, earlier end of the cycle uh, with this. But um, if you meet an investor and they want to change every aspect of your business plan in return for the money, well, then go and find another investor mm -hmm. because they're not going to run the company. You're going to run the company. It's your business. It's your plan. And uh, sometimes it takes more than, well, we all know it takes uh, more than talking to one investor, you might you might get lucky, but remember what luck means. Luck is defined by preparation meets opportunity, and you've heard a lot today about preparation and the importance of that from the, from the other panelists. So, absolutely, thank you. Well, that's gone so so quickly, um, but thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so I think, you know, it's clear that after a lull, there's definitely hunger out there for investment and M&A opportunities, but, but businesses clearly need to have the confidence, they need a clear proposition, they need to know where they stand in their market to make sure they can attract the best buyers at the best price. And as Damien said, be, uh, be, be brave. Um, and also need to keep one eye on the future as well, because in the last sort of year, 18 months has demonstrated how fast things can change with sort of digital transformation having um, been estimated to accelerate it at around seven um, years. Uh, with that in mind, um, More Global um, is perfectly positioned to help you find the right investment or acquisition partner. So if you would like a no obligations chat, then please um, do head to the More Kingston Smith booth um, where we'll be on hand and happy to have a discussion with you. Um, we'll also have our Director of Research and Development in that booth as well to answer any questions you might have on research and development um, because obviously this is quite a crucial part of the funding structure of businesses in this sort of creative and technology and digital and martech um, space in the UK. So again thank you so much for joining us it's been a pleasure to be part of today's conference I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I will hand you back to Janet. Thank you so much Esther and thanks to Damien, Patrick, Olivia and Jennifer too. And thank you for your positive, upbeat report. So things are looking up post-COVID. There's M&A recovery, growth capital boosted by investor confidence, access to capital up, more cross-border deals and deals outside of the region in Asia, and lots more deals in private equity in the UK. Things are looking up for Createc too. And we look forward to taking our partnership with more Kingston Smith forward with our Createc Ones to Watch program, where you're offering business consultancy to our top 100. If for those of you who haven't yet entered Createc Ones to Watch, there are just two weeks left to do it. We also have a booth at the Virtual Expo at COGEX, so do check us out. 25th of June is the deadline. The UK is taking the lead on Createc in the world. 
And with your global footprint at Morkings and Smith, we hope we can take it global with you too. Thanks so much for your time today. And thank you to everybody for allowing me to be MC for you today. Uh, this is the point in the day at which I stop. So I wish you a very enjoyable rest of the day when my colleague Leila Siddiqui will be taking over this role. Thank you.